So let's hear from Michael. Today I'm going to be talking about a, a survey I did of an um, international group of physiotherapists on the introduction of artificial intelligence into clinical practice. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the artificial intelligence components because I know that that probably isn't, <clears throat> um, isn't a big part of um, everyone's mindset at the moment. Um, so the, the main thing I want to talk about is what uh, participants were saying and the implications I think that this has on our um, training. Uh, so to start with, I think I just want to define uh, um, intelligence very broadly as saying the, that intelligence is conceived as being the ability of an agent to achieve objectives within its environment. And I think it's really important to note that intelligence does not equal consciousness. I think a big problem that people have with, with AI um, and machine learning in general is that they tend to conflate it with consciousness. And I think there's a lot of uh, baggage that comes with this idea of consciousness and what it means to be human. And so it kind of sets up um, a um, like a, an us versus them um, kind of paradigm, which I think is not particularly helpful. So when thinking about artificial intelligence, we're really just thinking about the ability of a software system to achieve objectives. And typically those are objectives that uh, we set um, through, through various um, uh, modeling processes. Uh, what we're talking about mainly uh, when it comes to AI is machine learning. And the, the main function of machine learning at this point is in the field of uh, narrow artificial intelligence, which is uh, basically trying to achieve very limited scope um, and narrow objectives um, rather than something that approaches um, human intelligence. Over the last few years, we've seen a massive increase in what's called compute, which is just really the um, the, the price of computational power. So we've seen increases in, in computation um, at much lower prices, and this is pushing the development of machine learning. Uh, we're seeing much bigger data sets and better algorithms. So the combination of those three things has led to the massive advances that we've seen in uh, machine learning and uh, narrow um, AI over the last five or 10 years. With respect to the implications of AI in society, um, AI reduces the cost of prediction. So uh, what we're really interested in uh, is the ability of algorithms to make predictions. And if you think about something like um, Google Maps, when you say, okay, Google, take me home, um, what Google does is it makes a prediction about what's going to be the fastest route for you to get home. Um, so that's what we talk about when we say that it will um, reduce the cost of prediction. And you're already seeing that you get all of that prediction for free. Um, prediction also relates to search results. So every time you do a search um, using Google or any search engine, um, what it's doing is it's returning a ranked order or a, a ranked list of results. And it's predicting that those that are higher in the list are the ones that you're actually interested in. Um, as the price of um, services and goods come down, they become commodities. And commodities are um, products and services that compete on price. Um, and so we're going to see um, AI uh, become ubiquitous in society um, because of this economic principle that um, basically uh, cheap changes everything. Uh, I'm not going to go into this into too much detail, but in the realm of healthcare, we're already seeing a massive explosion in research around natural language processing, clinical decision support, computer vision, expert systems, and robotics. Um, so these are just some areas of uh, AI research um, where we're seeing um, the introduction of, uh, again, products and services into health systems. So I was interested in finding out what clinicians think of the introduction of um, uh, some of this research into clinical practice. And so I, I did a survey in 2019. It was a self-developed questionnaire. I piloted it for face validity um, among nine physiotherapists who had published in, um, uh, in different areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, I sent the survey to all of the WCPT member organizations and a variety of professional organizations as well, and then uh, did a thematic analysis on the, uh, on the results. I think there were only about 59, um, there were only 59 physiotherapists who responded, um, 
and that was in a you know a, a survey that I left open for a long time and and really put a lot of effort into trying to get responses. So I think that it's an area where it's kind of not well recognized um, in the profession. Um, so I think that that in itself was instructive. So in terms of the responses um, for administration type tasks, um, most physiotherapists who responded were basically just saying, yep, this is fine. Um, so when it comes to taking a patient history uh, through a, a subject of assessment, um, uh, finances and invoicing, um, scheduling of patients, you know, reminders about attending sessions, um, capturing the conversation with patients and uh, converting that to text. Um, I think these are all things that, that most people were, were basically saying, yeah, that's fine, no problem. When it came to assessment type tasks, um, we saw a lot of participants saying maybe. Um, and if you look at the example there, you uh, this the, I chose this example because the, this person was quite explicit about saying um, assessment through motion capture. So basically that's a, um, a video, you, you take a video of a patient and then an algorithm is able to um, uh, analyze that video and um, uh, make some predictions about uh, patient outcomes um, as well as diagnosis. Uh, around the question of manual therapy, the general consensus seems to be not yet, but maybe one day. Um, and the quote here is just, uh, just an example. This was pretty typical of what the, these professionals were saying. Um, and just kind of making the point that this kind of the hands-on component of physiotherapy practice is not something that's going to be replicable by machines um, anytime soon. And, and then there was something that I was coding as the human factor. Um, and this took a variety of forms, but it, it basically was uh, participants making the point that there is something essential about a human relationship with another human being um, that a machine will never be able to replicate. And I think just personally, I, I have some doubts about this. Um, you know, there's, there's no way that we can, um, there's no way for us to know that anyone else in the world is not um, just a really well calibrated zombie. Um, we, we only have experience of our own consciousness. And uh, the only reason that we think other people are conscious is because they are really good at um, pretending to be conscious. Um, you know, that's a, a reasonably well supported philosophical position. And so we're not going to care if an AI is um, really compassionate. We're going to care that an AI appears compassionate. And so I think that just my personal um, view is that um, you, you should never say never. Um, okay, so those are the, I'll just go, let me just go back through those. So administration, yes, everyone says no, no problem. Uh, assessment, especially assessment at a distance, maybe. Manual therapy, not yet. And the human factor, never. So I started thinking about this idea of uh, calculators. And we know that calculators are super intelligent uh, when it comes to any kind of calculation, but no one feels threatened by calculating. And I was seeing in the data this kind of concern um, that, uh, oh, let me just get to the slide. Um, as AI systems increase in auton autonomy, resistance to AI was increasing. And so this is kind of my, my short um, explanation for what I was seeing in the data. Um, and the, the other big thing that I thought was interesting was that as the distance to the patient is reduced, so the resistance to AI increases. So if I go back to this uh, administration, um, that's something that is quite far removed from the patient, that the physical distance between you and a patient when doing administration is quite far. And we're seeing everyone saying, yep, no problem. When it comes to assessment through motion capture, for example, or imaging interpretation, range of motion, gait velocity, there is physical distance from the patient, especially if you consider that you're watching a video and the patient may not even be present. So physical distance again is, um, is increased. Manual therapy, you definitely hands-on. And so again, with the distance, the patient is, is closed again. And then that human factor, that, that interpersonal relationship, that connection to the patient, it doesn't get much closer than that. And that's when uh, I was seeing the resistance at, um, at its highest. 
Um, and the language also changed. The language when people were talking about this very close connection, um, this kind of almost human connection, uh, then you could see like people were using very strong language. Um, and to me, that indicated a uh, greater threat. So yeah, just to reiterate, um, uh, I think as therapists perceive AI systems to increase in autonomy, so their resistance to those systems increases. As the distance to the patient is reduced, again, the resistance to AI increases. But I did see a lot of people saying that they may start trusting these systems as they show competence. And so I thought that was um, an interesting finding. Um, that we might be seeing tiered levels of trust. But, and again, people were talking about trust um, for systems that were first far removed from the patient and then progressively getting closer to interaction with the patient. So therapists were saying that if they saw that AI-based systems were able to manage administration type tasks competently, then they might be able to trust them with more kind of high risk um, patient facing tasks or patient interacting type tasks. So to move forward, um, I need to go back and reanalyze the data to try and fill in some of these gaps. Um, so if I think about those four examples that I showed um, around um, assessment and, um, uh, sorry, administration, assessment, manual therapy, and uh, human interaction, um, I think I need to look for uh, additional data points that might help me to fill in some of those gaps. I'm looking for a theory or a model that might help me to explain some of this. And if, if any of you know anything that, that might help with that, then I'd really appreciate it. And um, the, the research project that I've uh, registered does include a series of interviews that I can do to explore some of these findings in a little bit more depth. So I'd like to take um, uh, what, what I found and put that to um, some therapists, maybe in a series of case studies where I could uh, explore in a little bit more depth what people are looking at, what they're, what they're interested in, and how they're thinking about some of these um, problems. Mm. And that's it.